All right. Well, it's my pleasure and delight to introduce Dr. Anthony R. Sweat today. Dr. Sweat is Associate Professor of Church History and Doctrine here at Brigham Young University. He grew up in West Valley and served a mission in Bolivia. He received a BFA in painting and drawing from the University of Utah in 1999 and his PhD in curriculum and instruction in 2011 from Utah State University. Prior to joining the religion faculty here at BYU, he worked for 13 years with seminaries and institutes. Dr. Sweat is the author of several books and articles related to the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As a practicing artist, his paintings center on previously undepicted but important aspects of Latter-day Saint history to promote visual learning. He and his wife, Cindy, are the parents of seven children, and they reside in Springville, Utah. As a per personal anecdote, I first met Dr. Sweat about five years ago at a luncheon here in the library. We spoke briefly about research interests and he, his prior work at seminaries and institute. But what grabbed my attention was when he told me he was an artist. There are not very many artist scholars out there. It takes a uniquely talented mind to be accomplished in both. During our conversation, Dr. Sweat showed me a picture on his phone of a painting he was working on in which depicted Joseph Smith and the translation process, including holding the seer stone and his hat. We talked about the implications of Dr. Sweat's painting and how we as consumers can sometimes expect too much of the art when it comes to religious events. We can be caught in the erroneous assumption that everything we see in religious art is 100% historically accurate when many times the artist has had to fill in some gaps, if you will, in our own historical memory. Since that conversation years ago, Dr. Sweat has kept me updated on his painting, and I knew when Ryan and I started this exhibit that I wanted to see something from Dr. Sweat in it if he had something to contribute. So I contacted him, and it just so happened that he had just finished something that he would later call First Visions which is the original painting now hanging, hanging in the exhibit. Not only are we lucky to have his original art in the exhibit, but as we celebrate the centennial of the first vision today, we are also delighted to hear from Dr. Sweat and his topic, Visualizing the Vision, a history of first vision art. Dr. Sweat will share with us his thoughts on how the various depictions of the first vision over the years has influenced how we think about that event. So now, Will you join with me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Sweat this afternoon? Thanks, Father. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay with this lapel mic? Thank you for being here. Uh, I uh, so appreciate it. I'm just honored to get to speak about uh, the first vision, Joseph Smith, art history, and art. I mean, does it get more celestial than that? with great people as well. Uh, and I hope I can share something that uh, gives you some insight into the first vision, into how we imagine it and what we think about it as we analyze these images. As uh, Garrett mentioned, I, as a uh, professor in church history and doctrine, uh, I love the doctrinal aspects of the first vision, the historical aspects. But as uh, somebody with a bachelor's in fine art, I am also really interested in how we depict the first vision. As a matter of fact, one of my earliest personal memories that I have is being in ninth grade seminary and sitting down, uh, personal in terms of spiritual, powerful personal spiritual experiences. In ninth grade seminary, uh, getting an assignment to uh, do a project for seminary and I did my own little drawing of the first vision um, uh, and it, I still remember it uh, what I did and so I thought about this for a long time and hope that you'll enjoy this process I like this is from a quote called the ministry of a book called the ministry of art what is true in religion uh, by Frank Bristol what is true in religion inspires what is true in art and what is false in art comes from what is false in the religion which inspires it. 
As Christianity has revived and elevated art, so art has glorified Christianity. It has set forth her doctrines, portrayed her saints, and even her very God and Savior. Limited only by the necessary restrictions of her powers, art has been a teacher of things divine. It has robed religion and loveliness and crowned her, with her white brow with jewels of beauty. It has reared the noblest structures that adorn the earth to her honor and service. Not to science, not to letters, not to philosophy, not to liberty, not to nature, not to art itself, but to religion has art dedicated its most glorious achievements whether in painting and sculpture or in architecture. That's a cool quote, I think, about the power that art has on us. Um, and we use art a ton, uh, particularly with the first vision. I've gone through every, since the Enzyme began in 1971, I've gone through and looked at every artistic depiction that's ever been published of the first vision, which means my TAs have found those for me, and then I analyze it and take all the credit. <laughs> I'm so grateful to have my research aides that helped me. It's been depicted in the Enzyme since 1971, 167 times. Nearly double any other restoration theme other than pioneers. Uh, by the way, pioneers are the most oft depicted thing that we show in the Enzymes. We just love our pioneers. The restoration of the priesthood has been depicted 101 times, Book of Mormon translation 55 times, Joseph Smith's martyrdom 40 times, Moroni appearing and instructing Joseph 33 times, the three and the eight witnesses 18 times. Uh, in terms of first vision art, uh, Greg Olson's our favorite. We've shown his images 24 times, Gary Cap 21 times, Walter Rain 18 times, Del Parson 15 times. And that's just in the enzyme, that's not including the friend. Um, uh, or the new era as well. However, this idea that we show the first vision or art about uh, our history and doctrine is a relatively recent phenomenon within the last hundred years of the church. There's very, very few uh, depictions. I've gone through every church magazine, the Millennial Star, Times and Seasons, the Prophet, uh, um, the era, the improvement era, the era, everything, and looked at, pulled out every image of church history and doctrine. As you can see, between 1830 and 1900, there's less than three dozen images total that deal with or that try to depict our church's early history or early doctrinal beliefs. We don't really start publishing imagery until the mid 20th century in terms of artistic imagery with our words. Can I be as blunt as to say this? Our church was extremely slow on the uptake when it came to publishing images with words. Today we do it a lot, but some of the early, like Harper's Weekly, and um, they were much, much better at this. We were really, really slow at it. Here, by the way, is the first, what I would call, artistic image our church ever published in 1835. And it's a little thing on God is love. If you read that uh, across the middle there, it, it says over and over and over again, God is love, God is love, up and down. Or 1842, uh, we published uh, the facsimiles from the Pearly Great Price in one of our church's newspapers. Uh, I automatically knew that the book of Abraham was true when I was a kid because it was the only scriptures that had pictures. <laughs> In 1845, uh, in, the mag in the the newspaper, The Prophet, we have these little rudimentary profiles of the villainous Thomas Sharp and the beloved prophet Joseph Smith. This, by the way, is the earliest depiction of what we might call the plan of salvation uh, by Orson Hyde, the diagram of the kingdom of God. That thing at the top represents a British crown, like and every line is somebody who has been sealed up to God. And then the line going into that is somebody who's sealed to that person. It kind of visualizes the church's early conception of sealing, in particular dynastic sealing. Well, why is there so, lim so very few imagery early on? I believe it's because of the um, uh, Protestant icon iconoclastic culture. You've got to remember the Protestants were pretty anti for the most part, especially the Puritans, they're pretty anti-imagery, particularly 
as they're fighting against Catholicism, which has been so pro visual arts and visual imagery. I mean, you cannot go into early Catholic cathedrals and not be blown away by their artistry. Um, this is what one person said, English Puritans who settled America loved Jesus, but hated visual representations of him. English settlers considered it blasphemous to depict Jesus visually, violating the second of the Ten Commandments. Art was removed from churches and banned as part of worship. And I think that bled over a little bit into the Restoration. Uh, we, we have a lot of converts who are coming from Protestant uh, backgrounds and visual imagery, particularly in our chapels, in our worship. Uh, I'm not sure it was overtly embraced by them. Even today, by the way, if you want to see a remnant of it, how many chapels do we build today that have paintings in them? How many visual images do we have in our, in our sacrament meeting halls? Uh, we just don't do it anymore. We'll go into the into the go to the little flowery couch in the foyer and you'll see paintings above it but into the chapel itself we're pretty iconoclast still as a church so it helps answer why there's not very many images of the first vision early on I also think that just the church itself and I know Dr. Harper uh, in his presentation touched on this so I'll just give a quick summary of it one of the things we need to realize is art is a form of social production. In other words, what a culture values, art usually follows. Um, so like in today's culture with lots of uh, female empowerment, which is a great message, you see lots of films and lots of heroines that focus on female empowerment. Um, uh, and in the early church, when uh, there was not a lot of focus on the first vision, overtly. You just don't see a lot of first vision art uh, that way either. This is what James Allen, one of the earliest researchers on the development of the first vision writes, quote, the first vision was not always so well known or frequently used by the general membership of the church. Only in 1838 did Joseph Smith prepare an account of it for official publication. Not until 1840 did any account appear in print. And not for another half century was it publicly discussed with great regularity or used for the wide variety of purposes to which it lends itself today? Just uh, taking a quick look in the General Conference corpus, this is a search of first vision by decade of how often the first vision was mentioned in General Conference. You can start to see the explosion there, 1910s, 20s, 30s, or Sacred Grove, again, 1910s, 20s, 30s. We're just not talking a ton about it until the turn of the century, 1910s, 20s, 30s. Uh, Steve Harper has written, although Joseph did write and speak about it, he did so privately among small groups of followers. His 1832 and 35 account, which many of you have studied, stay locked away in a trunk, packed away and forgotten for over 100 years until they come to the surface. Orson Pratt publishes some accounts, and Orson Pratt's probably one of the most early and vocal users of the first vision as a doctrinal piece of importance for us. But if you and I were in the church in the 1830s and 40s, and we talked about Joseph's revelation or God ministering to Joseph, we would generally start the narrative with Moroni and not with the first vision. A huge thing that started to change that was the canonization of the Pearl of Great Price. It was put together in 1851 for the saints over uh, in the British mission. But then as they immigrate and bring that pamphlet here, and then it gets canonized in 1880, suddenly church membership has an official canonized published account, and it starts to uh, uh, become more common among members of the church uh, to know about the first vision. There's some other things that start to affect how we view the vision as well. One of them is that for so many years, from the 1840s, particularly in the 50s and 60s into the 70s, the defining thing in our church, particularly from outsiders and for practitioners, was our practice of plural marriage. Then as the federal government began to enact laws to limit and outright make plural marriage illegal, and particularly with the 1887 Edmonds-Tucker Act that disenfranchised the church, or threatened to, um, 
uh, leading to Wilford Woodruff getting the revelation to issue the manifesto in the 1890s, our church is suddenly left saying, what defines us? If plural marriage isn't one of our central things that defines us, what does define us? And this is back to how culture influences art. You're seeing all this come together. Scholar Kathleen Flake writes, the first vision contained the elements necessary to fill the historical, scriptural, and theological void left by the abandonment of plural marriage. So as we move on from plural marriage as a church around the turn of the century in the early 1900s, we start to say then doctrinally, theologically, what is our message and what sets us apart? And you start to see people start to preach and say the first vision teaches us about two distinct beings. And you start to see the first vision using as a theological basis for some of our most important doctrines uh, that we embrace as a people. And as the first vision solidifies as a basis of our self-understanding, we start to see it represented in art to express ourselves as a people. The earliest depiction of the first vision done artistically, ironically, is not done by a Latter-day Saint. It's published in a book by T.B.H. Stenhouse, who has left the church and uh, doesn't like Brigham Young, and he publishes a book called Rocky Mountain Saints uh, that is full of a number of illustrations from fabulous illustrators uh, from back east. You ready for the first official image if you haven't seen it before? Here's our first artistic depiction of the first vision. Done by a non-Latter-day Saint in a book criticizing Latter-day Saints. A little different than kind of how we show it today. I love this, though. It shows the Father and the Son flying towards. Don't you get that feeling of them coming towards you this way instead of coming down? I like how boyish Joseph looks. I've tried to figure out who created this image. It's unknown. I've even re reached out to different early lithographers who study early lith lithography. Um, it's unknown who, who created this image, but it's in TBH Stenhouse's book. Probably the first LDS depiction comes from CCA Christensen, who did his big moving panorama series, these roughly seven foot by ten foot panoramas of important early church scenes. This painting is lost, but in the transcript of his narrative that was given as these panoramas would be shown, he says this scene, the first one, represents the first vision of Joseph Smith, the prophet. He was at the time but a boy between 14 and 15 years of age, almost in despair. He sees a glorious light in the heavens gradually descending. Two glorious personages appear, the father and the son. This image is so impactful that CCA Christensen paints that one day a person who's selling musical instruments uh, by the name of George Manwaring stops by uh, CCA Christensen's studio behind the roller mills down there in Ephraim, Utah. And he's so impressed he writes the song, uh, Oh How Lovely Was the Morning or Joseph Smith's First Prayer. So we're seeing art begin to reflect uh, and use the arts to teach people about the first vision in the late 1800s. By the way, kind of fun, I gave a presentation on CCA Christensen and providentially this person comes up to me and his name was Alec Andrus and he says, I was a boy when CCA Christensen's panoramas were rediscovered. Um, and he says, they were brought to my house and I remember us unrolling them. And he said, I remember the first vision painting CCA Christensen's first vision painting. It's lost today. We don't know where it's at. And I said, can you search your memory bank, which is not always the most reliable, because this person's an older man now, and send me what you remember. And this was his write-up to me. He says, quote, my recollection through the filter of 65 plus years later was that Brother Christensen's painting of the first vision was different than my mental image of the event. And I asked Dad why presentation of the Father and Jesus was not at all what I envisioned. He told me about the use of the display as the Christensen brothers carried it through the earliest communities in the 1910s to 1930s, and that it was consistent with Brother Christensen's other images. I think that that may have been the first painting or illustration of the first vision that I had seen, 
and it was not nearly as grand or ethereal as I thought it should be. I think the first panel was damaged by mildew and mold, and I think that was the first vision panel. So you don't want to know what happened to that painting, probably, was that when they rolled up, when they re-rolled up, because all those panoramas were stitched together into one long scroll, what painting was wrapped on the outside? It would have been the first vision panel, and it was probably destroyed by mold or mildew as it sat in some warehouse for decades and decades. If you know where it's at, come talk to me. I want to see it. That's what I'm trying to say to you. This is probably the next earliest artistic depiction of the first vision. It's in the Salt Lake Temple Holy of Holies. Don't ask me how I got this photo. Um, and this is done by Tiffany and Company, uh, the, the glass company. Um, Joseph Don Carlos Young reaches out to Tiffany and Company in 1892. Um, it's 12 feet high by four and a half feet wide. And by the way, I, obviously I did not take this photo, but I did have a little tender mercy just a week ago. Um, I was in the Salt Lake Temple and um, can you guys still hear me okay? I think this mic's cut out. Am I being loud enough? Okay. I was in the Salt Lake Temple a week ago and when this session was over, I walked over to show my daughter some of the stained glass that Tiffany and company had done that was on display. And this random worker sees me and he goes, he goes, do you want to see some other ones? And he invited me into the back room where Lorenzo Snow's office used to be and let me stare at the Tiffany and company stained glass of the first vision from the back side of it. Um, uh, looking, so I, I, was, I was able to sit there and stare at this just about a week ago from the back side of it. And Don Carlos Young gives some great descriptions on what he wants it to look like. I'm going to skip those for now, but it's really, really cool. By the way, this is a neat one, too. In the Salt Lake Temple, there used to be a sculpture um, that was in the Salt Lake Temple. This sculpture is now lost as well. But we know it's there because when C.R. Savage goes through and photographs the interior of the Salt Lake Temple, he takes this photograph. And I'm grateful to um, my colleague, um, Alonzo Gaskell, for sharing this with me. Uh, Alonzo Gaskell and his research assistant have found the base of the sculpture, but the sculpture's lost. Uh, this is the sculpture. It's a monument sculpture. You can see on the right, I've put maybe Cyrus Dallin. I think Cyrus Dallin, who sculpted the angel Moroni, is the only monument sculptor in the church at this time who's talented enough to produce a sculpture like this. And this was probably a monument sculpture. It was probably a proposal for a monument to be built somewhere in Utah or in, this, in Salt Lake City. And today, either somebody wasn't looking and knocked it over and shattered it, or it's with CCA Christensen's painting of it as well, buried somewhere. But the reason why I want to show you this is because if you look close, you can see Joseph and Hiram there uh, on it. And then right below, you see a, a sculpture of the first vision. And I like this not only because you see the Father and the Son, but look behind the Father and the Son, and you see some angels there, uh, which means that maybe the earlier church was a little more prone to put angels in the, uh, with the first vision than we become in the 1900s. Uh, in the, at the turn of the century, many chapels actually do put imagery and they use stained glass. I personally think stained glass is one of the best mediums to show artistic images of the first vision because it uses light. And what better medium than to use light to show the first vision? This is in the Salt Lake uh, 17th Ward, done in 1907. Here's the Liberty Ward in 1908. Here's the Brigham City Ward in 1911. Uh, here's the Salt Lake Second Ward, 1913. You can see these are all, and by the way, you can see the similarities between these and the one done by Tiffany and Company in the Holy of Holies. Here's the one in, uh, that was in Los Angeles. It's now in the Church Museum of History and Art, 1913. Here's one in San Bernardino Ward in 1930. Kind of cool, Joseph, with like a little green cape or something. It's pretty awesome. One of the earliest, and I'm including this as an artistic image, it's a photograph that was done in 1907 by George Edward Anderson. 
It was published in a 1909 uh, Sunday school book. And this photograph becomes really well known in the church around the turn of the century. Uh, George Anderson told when he took the photo, you can see a little boy standing there on the bottom right. That boy was 12 years old. And George Anderson told him to go stand over there. It's a pretty epic image, I think. Uh, probably the first artistic, either drawing or painting, was published in 1912 by the church. And it's this one by Louis A. Ramsey. And he did a number of illustrations for this book, From Plowboy to Prophet. Uh, the church also published in 1912. This is the inside of the Holy of Holies right here, by the way, uh, in the Salt Lake Temple. A person tried to hold the church uh, at ransom. He was let into the Salt Lake Temple by a gardener, and he took a bunch of photographs of the inside of the Salt Lake Temple. And then he tried to extort the church and say, pay me $100,000 or I'll publish these photos of your temple. And Joseph F. Smith said, I'm not going to pay a thief. And instead he hired C.R. Savage to go through and photograph the Salt Lake Temple. And he said, we'll just publish them ourselves. <laughs> and it's published in um, James E. Talmadge's book, uh, The House of the Lord. So that's in 1912. It was technically published by the Deseret News Press church owned but close enough and you can see the holy of holies and the uh, stained glass there they also published the stained glass in the 1931 in the juvenile instructor but this is the first time an image of the first vision shows up in a church magazine 1931 so a hundred years since the organization of the church a few years later in 1938 in the millennial star uh, they show this one, uh, stained glass by J. Leo Fairbanks. I'm trying to track down where this stained glass is as well. Um, here is a painting done by J. Leo Fairbanks on the cover of the Millennial Star in 1942. And it's an oil painting. So this is really the first time, you, look at those dates. This is really the first when we really start saying, oh, let's get some paintings. Let's get some drawings. Let's start publishing them in our church periodicals. It's a hundred years after the church is organized that we start doing this. Around this same time, we get artists who, this is Minerva Teichart, who many of you are familiar with. And God bless Minerva. She is an amazing artist who saw absolutely zero success in her lifetime. Uh, the church does not really use these. Um, BYU acquires them and begins to use them in the 1970s, 80s, and then in the 1990s they gain some traction. I can't find us publishing Minerva's paintings, though, at the time when she paints them. But here's hers, 1930. Here's another one she does in 1934. Here's one, another one by Leo Fairbanks. Uh, he dies in 1946. We don't know when he does this little oil sketch. I have dug up, though, that he was proposing to do some panoramas for the church and this was a, a study for that so it's probably sometime 1920s 1930s uh, around there it would be my guess here's one by Arnold Freiberg in 1960 isn't that awesome that's this one's not very well known uh, at all I just love like the mystical quality of this one almost like there's a fog or something uh, isn't that a fun way to visualize it? Kind of, um, man, it's just cool. Uh, here's the actual painting that he does in 1962. Here's one in 65 by Dorothy Hanley. This was a little, um, as you can see, a whole piece that was done. You see the first vision on the side over there. Kenneth Riley, the church, it's interesting in the 1960s and 70s, the church basically turns outward to non-Latter-day Saint illustrators to illustrate our history. Kenneth Riley's one of them, 1965. John Scott, 1969. This is the one that was in, when I was a missionary, this is the one that was in the flip charts that we would use to teach people. And I used to joke with my companion as I'd show this painting. I'd say in the spring of 1820, there was a 35-year-old man named Joseph Smith. <laughs> That's the oldest looking 14 year old boy I've ever seen in my life. He's got a nice, nice jaw though. 
Jerry Thompson's in 1970. This accompanied an era article, an improvement era article, uh, trying to show the different accounts of the first vision. Ted Henninger, 1975. Dale Kilborn, um, the year's unknown on this, but roughly the same time period as when Kilborn's painting. Gary Ernest Smith, 1979. This one hangs in the Jordan River Temple, the original does. Paul Forrester, this is perhaps one of the earliest images trying to show uh, the adversary being cast out. This is pretty progressive and ahead of its time, in my opinion. Del Parsons, 1987. We're probably all, now we're starting to enter into imagery that we're like, I know these. These speak to my heart. Greg Olson, 1988. 1989, that one's on the cover of the Church History and the Fullness of Times Institute Manual. William Lee Hill, right around this time. I'm trying to still track down some of these dates. Floyd Warren is a woodcut, or a lino cut, actually, which means you cut into linoleum and ink it and print it. Uh, an early international one, this one's from Indonesia, that was submitted for a church art competition. I think this one's pretty cool. Uh, and this one as well. Uh, from Sierra Leone is where this one's coming in 1992. Glenn Hopkinson, Jerry Hartston, 1995. Frank Magleby, who is a art professor here at BYU, 1995. We're getting them now in primary lessons. 1995 primary lesson, Greg Olson, 1996. By the way, my brother <laughs> lives in North Carolina, had some neighbors that just really did not like Latter-day Saints. They were uh, Protestant Christians and just really didn't like Latter-day Saints, but tolerated my brother. And over time, my brother and his wife won him over. And one time, <laughs> my, my brother said, his neighbors invited him over to say, come look at this cool painting we just bought. And they bought this painting. <laughs> and my brother pointed to the figure in the back and said, did you see that? And they're like, yeah, what is that? And my, my brother said, this is just a painting about prayer. Because <laughs> he knew if he told him it was the first vision, they'd take it down. <laughs> Liz Lemon Swindle, 1998, with her uh, series that she did. Uh, Walter Rain, who I think is the Mormon Rembrandt, starts to begin to paint it in 1998. That's his first uh, depiction of it. Leon Parson up in Idaho. This is Del Parson's brother, 1999. Gary Cap, 2000. This is one of the most oft-used ones the church publishes in the Enzyme. Gary Cap again showing the dark satanic influence, 2000. Glenn Hopkinson right around this time. Tom Holdman and Holdman Studios put this stained glass in. So this is our return to stained glass. As you can see, it's about 100 years later by the time we get a stained glass image again. And this one sits in the Palmyra New York Temple, if you've been there. Walter Rain, I'm so glad that he does these. 2000, Walter Rain again in 2000. I don't know about that guy. This is one of my earliest paintings that I wanted to do. I wanted to try to show the column of light pushing out the darkness. You can see uh, there. Walter Rain again in 2004, again in 2005. Simon Dewey, 2005. Cub Scouts, 2005. <laughs> we officially get one from the Cubs. The friend, we want kids to color it now. In the spring of 1820, there was a 35-year-old named Joseph Smith. <laughs> Michael Bedard's 2008. This one's been pretty well received. I've seen this one around a lot. David Lindsley, 2015. You can see we just keep going, going, going. It's like, it's almost like a faucet. It, it takes the church 100 years to really start producing images of the first vision. And over the next 100 years, particularly beginning in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, we see an explosion of first vision imagery. John McNaughton, 2015. And what I want to show you is the first vision becomes a symbol. Take a look and just look what's common in all of those. We put a boy in a grove of trees, put him on his knees or on sitting down or kneeling, 
put him in white shirt and brown pants. That's become the costume for Joseph. Get him going like this. And we start going first vision. South Park even picks up on it and uses this one. And that becomes our symbol I, uh, of the first vision. By the way, white, I joke around about white shirt, brown pants. Almost every painting of Joseph Smith, he wears a white shirt and brown pants. White shirt and brown pants, white shirt and brown pants. You want to notice where the weird white shirt, brown pants comes from? It's or wear, white shirt wearing in the church. It's because of the paintings of Joseph Smith. <laughs> if you are aware of white shirt, you're more righteous than if you wear a colored shirt, apparently. Well, let me show you what happens with this symbol. I, this is actually a really landmark painting of the first vision by Jeff Pugh. He painted this in one day. But now you can start to abstract it. And you can just put two lighter beings, a boy, white shirt, brown pants, and some greenery, and Latter-day Saints go, first vision. If we had showed this to the church in 1830, they'd, they'd have no idea what this is. None. Uh, not only stylistically, but content-wise either. Look at how we're starting. We can start to stylize and abstract it. And you and I know that this is the first vision. Sounds kind of cool. So much so that I did this little image <laughs> on, my power, on my computer. I just created this in PowerPoint. And then I walked around and showed it to people. You're so nice. Okay, so hold, hold on. Okay, hi, what's your name? I'm Emily Magleby. Hi, Emily. Emily. Yes. Uh, what do you see in this image? Uh, I see uh, an individual. Uh, I guess communicating or somehow communicating two personages. It reminds me of the first vision. Why does it remind you of the first vision? Uh, because we always see in pictures of the first vision Joseph Smith kneeling with his uh -huh. hand to his face okay. and two bright images okay. or two personages, I guess, okay. in the picture. And awesome. so because they're yellow, that's what it reminds me of. And All right. He's in the same form. That so the, the pose here is making you think of Joseph? Yes, the Anything pose. else? Um, I guess the pants, we always see them in a white shirt and brown pants, brown too. Brown pants, okay. Yeah. Oh, You're awesome. You know, yeah. Thanks so much. Look at this one. Did you say something? Huh? Tell me, what you, oh. what you, tell me what you see in this. I so said that was Joseph Smith seeing uh, two pillars of light. Now, why did you say you thought it was Joseph Smith? Uh, to be honest, uh, brown pants, and I expect religious things from Brother Sweat. <laughs> <laughs> now we can start to make logos out of it or we can put it in music videos Brandon Flowers who comes from a Latter-day Saint background has a really cool he's a really well-known musician his song only the young he sits there and performs on a stage and at one point all these angels and things start to come down in a pillar of light and Brandon Flowers goes like this that is a direct nod to the first vision However, here's one of the problems, is as we start to adopt this symbol, I personally believe it can limit us as to the potentials of the vision. If we actually look at the accounts, and we're fortunate from the scholarship that began to be done in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, through the Joseph Smith papers, and then making all these accounts so easily accessible to us, we get some interesting things. One of the things, if you look at the account, it doesn't appear, in, in my reading of them, that the Father and the Son appeared at the same time. A personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame that was spread all around. Another personage soon appeared, like unto the first. Directly I saw a light, a glorious personage light, and then another personage. Saw a personage in the fire light. After a while, another person come to the side of the first. Or how about showing it as a pillar of fire? Pillar of fire pillar of flame, fire towards heaven. Or 35, I saw many angels in the vision. Was it a visitation or was it a vision? And don't, don't think I'm being weird on that. I fully 100% believe in the reality of the first vision. But like Paul, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. Joseph says when he is finished, look at his mind was caught away from the objects. When he was finished, he finds himself on his back. 
The vision might be far more expansive in scope than we sometimes depict it. This is uh, one that was sent to me. And this person saying, I think it was more like a prophetic vision call to Joseph Smith. Almost like Lehi or, um, or Nephi or Isaiah, where the heavens, the curtain of heaven was opened up to Joseph. Or this one from Galen Smith. I think this one's really interesting. You see the angels all around, the pose, adopting the symbol. How many figures do you notice there? Three. Why three heavenly beings? The Father and the Son and who else? Could either be the Holy Ghost or who else could it be? Heavenly Mother. If you go to the exhibit that's put up right now, you'll see from, I think it's um, Susie Young Gates, she publishes that the first vision tells us that if there's a father, there's also a mother. And you hear a student, you can read a student echo that same idea. I've had multiple people ask me, do you think mother in heaven was there? What do you notice, by the way, that the church just changed in the young women's motto? We are daughters of our heavenly parents. This is Kirk Richards' image of the first vision. Literally, he is painting this right now. He just sent it to me over the weekend. Um, that one's pretty cool, isn't it? You get This is the first public unveiling. I'm showing it without his permission. <laughs> Sorry, Kirk. But I just think it's so amazing. Opening up some possibilities. And by the way, do you notice what Kirk's doing here? I'm just, just show you artistically. You see the many angels. You see the heavenly beings. But you also see this line coming out of Joseph's head. And Kirk describes this almost like a thought bubble or an umbilicus. Connecting and opening up a vision of heaven, so to speak. Uh, and I'll end by showing you mine. Um, this is the one that I did um, for a project I'm working on. I wanted to try to incorporate the nine accounts see the axe on the bottom right early spring Satan we don't often show Satan being banished on the far left father and the son not appearing at the same time one and then the other the pillar of fire the many angels I'm trying to bring them together into a cohesive scene a little bit more and as I conclude I just want to say this who is to say it's culture that drives our first vision art and who is to say what culture and revelatory factors may press upon the church and thus the artists that tell its story in the year 2120 or 2220? What will first vision art look like 100 or 200 years from now? Cultural and revelatory tectonic plates may cause visuals of the first vision to recede and crumble into the oceans of the past or to be thrust even higher up on the mountaintop of importance. Only time will tell, but undoubtedly there will be a visual record uh, to tell it. Thank you for uh, being here to this day. Thank you. We've got about four or five minutes for questions, it looks like. One right here, just right front, ask away. Yeah. I was wondering about the stained glass. Are are they still in existence? Are they still uh, in yeah, the Yeah, most definitely. You can go around. She asked about the stained glass. It's still in existence. You can go around to a lot of these early uh, churches and, and go see them. You can go see the one from the Los Angeles Ward of the Church Museum of History and Art right now. <laughs> Which one? My earlier one? My last one? This one? Because I didn't want to do white shirt, brown pants. <laughs> also, um, artistically, this is just why sometimes with art's not literal history. I don't know what clothes Joseph wore. But I wanted to draw your eye to Joseph and also let the whites be mainly on the father and the son and not have Joseph, if I would have put Joseph in white, it would have visually 
uh, been two, two same, same, same. I had to have Joseph pop a little bit different. Yeah. Does that help, Scott? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> blue pants, you know, brown shirt will be the new symbol. Yeah, she asked about the halos, and you don't normally see these in LDS art. I like the halos. They're a symbol that's often used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in Christian art. To It's back to symbols. It's a symbol of heavenly we would say exaltation and be the reason why I added them is because when I put the many angels in there in the background I again wanted a separation that we believe the father and the son are exalted beings gods different than angels so to me that was another visual way I could separate them slightly uh, from it yeah I'll let that be in your mind, my good brother. Um, it's interesting. I, in, I deliberately, in my mind, see the father being the one next to Joseph, uh, down behind him. And again, back to symbols. Sy symbolically, where do we normally place the son? We normally place him on the right hand. As a matter of fact, Joseph Don Carlos Young, when he writes Tiffany and Company, he says, place Jesus on the right hand of the father. How many of the first vision accounts say that Jesus stood on the right hand of the Father? Absolutely none of the actual accounts say that. They don't say that. That's just a symbol we've picked up. And so I like to think of the Father speaking to Joseph, talking to Joseph, and then turning and introducing the Son and having him come down. So in my reading of it, the Son's the one uh, coming down. If you want it to be the Father, let it be the Father. I'm flexible. Yes, brother. Yeah. Um, because I, I wanted that sense of surprise. I wanted that sense of shock or not quite grasping what's happening. Um, yeah. And there's something to somebody coming up behind you. I mean, I know they came down. The accounts say they came down from above. But there's something to like this, this turning um, that to me sends of I wasn't expecting this. That's why I chose that. I could have, I could have turned him, but I also didn't want his back to the viewer. Um, I wanted the viewer to see Joseph too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which exhibit? Oh, the, the one here for the Harold B. Lee Library? If you walk out and um, let's see. It's just right across right here. You go into the special collections right there and walk right in. You'll see it. Yeah. Yes. So what, why don't we see more any halos in Oh, don't get me started on wings and halos, my brother. <laughs> he asked, why don't we see more halos in LDS art? Because if I could be really blunt, uh, you and I say we're a symbolic people, but we're literalists. We don't deal really well with symbolism, particularly in representational art. Now, if it's abstracted art, we're better at it. But when people do representational art, which means it's realistic, our minds interpret it as real. And so we see an angel with wings and we say, don't put wings on him. Where Joseph says wings are symbolic of an angel's ability to move and act. Uh, in my personal view, there's totally nothing wrong with, with depicting angels with wings. Um, if we can learn to be a people who aren't so literal with our visuals, um, uh, instead of being more figurative and symbolic. So as a people, if we, if we truly become a more figurative and symbolic uh, literate people, I think we'll start seeing artwork that reflects the culture again. 
but as a culture, we've been pretty literal as a whole. There's only a handful of females who have, yeah. yeah. Where are they? That's a good question. Um, right now, we're seeing an explosion of women artists in the church. There's an exhibit right now um, called Certain Women that uh, I, I don't know how many. It's 100 different female Latter-day Saint artists. Um, and so there, it's happening. I think, like, back to culture. Um, I'm just not sure our culture fostered a lot of women as being uh, painters, but now we are, and I'm positive we'll start to see some a lot more female depictions. Minerva Tyker is the pioneer in terms of female painters, particularly of the first vision. It's a really good question. Okay, I don't want to hold you too long, but Garrett, you're the you're the boss. It's <laughs> it's it's two fifty five, brother. Yeah, if anybody needs to go to class or whatever, um, we'll end it there. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if anyone wants to yeah. hang after. Thank let's, you again uh, for let's coming. Let's thank him one though. more time.